Sorry, I've just been asked to make an announcement. There's no coffee or food allowed in the room, only water. So if you have some, yeah. eat it quickly. <laughs> Drink it quickly.
All right, everyone ready on, on the podium? I think we're going to start, it's already a little bit late. Welcome to the final session of the day, titled 10 Years On, Past, Present and Future of ACHS. Uh, all the speaking up here is going to be in English, so please, if you need the Spanish, we have the simultaneous translation. And because of this, and because I speak really fast, I'm going to stick to a script that we prepared for this. I'm Trinidad Rico, I'm the Vice President for Chapters at ACHS, and I've been on this role or similar roles since right after Canberra on the second conference, on the second meeting. I'm currently the Director of Heritage Conservation at the University of Southern California, and I'm stepping down from the Executive Committee this year, so it gives me great pleasure to be hosting the celebration of the 10th anniversary of ACHS. We thought it would be a good idea to organize a roundtable that brings together founders of the association, past and current ACHS presidents, and early career researchers to reflect with you on the original aims of the organization, milestones and progress, as well as future directions for critical heritage studies in addressing the mounting challenges of today. I'm happy to be joined today by the ACHS founding president, that needs no introduction, Laura Jane Smith, founding member, John Giblin. <laughs> Um, past President Lucy Morissette. <laughs> Current President Extraordinaire Melissa Bird. <laughs> and Early Career Researcher Network member Victoria Vargas Downing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Before we begin our discussion, we will first be playing short videos prepared in advance by founding member Bosse Lagervist and Early Career Research Network members Stanley Onyemechalu and Rosling Ang. Each of our video contributors were asked to reflect on the most pressing issue in heritage studies at present, how they envision the future of critical heritage studies, and in what ways they would like to see ACHS grow. So let's hear from them now. Hi, my name is Ross Ling Ang. I work with indigenous Ainu people located on settler-occupied northern Japan, specifically in cultural revitalization and transmission in their songs and dances. I am uh, an independent scholar uh, and also working part-time as a lecturer in Nanyang Technological University and the National University of Singapore. Hi, I am Bustelogifist. I have a slight cold, so you had to excuse my voice. <laughs> I am an associate professor and vice head at the Department of Conservation at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And at the department, I'm responsible for educational activities comprising of four bachelor programs and two master's programs. I'm also the lead ICOMAS scholar in the Erasmus Plus Blueprint project on Charter Alliance that has the objective to establish the heritage field as a sector of economic importance in Europe by defining and describing occupation skills and knowledges of relevance for the field today, but also and primarily perhaps for the future challenges and how the educational systems relate to, cooperate with and drives this professional development. Hello everyone, my name is Stanley Jachike Onyemechalo, a second year PhD student in archaeology at the University of Cambridge. I am also a lecturer in archaeology and heritage studies at the University of Nigeria and Suka. My main interest in critical heritage studies is on the politics and the ethics of representing indigenous peoples, settler colonial heritage, and the erasure and valorization of indigenous peoples. Within this arena, I explore museum studies, uh, specifically in the politics of production, and uh, settler normative reception of various uh, materialized representation of indigenous peoples. Another arena I focus on will be the 
concept of living heritage, specifically on communities as practitioners and the social political structures they are entrenched in. Currently, my PhD is rooted in conflict heritage studies, where I'm exploring the relationship between cultural heritage and legacies of violent conflicts in the context of Nigeria's civil war. My interests also cut across indigenous heritage management, museum studies, public or community archaeology, and sustainable heritage management. My main interest in this study field is the role of heritage as an ongoing dynamic process for sustainable societal development, where we could see heritage as a common good with qualities and properties that we could develop and build further on. The most pressing issues in heritage studies will be that of represent reparations and following that the need to address power imbalance in knowledge production within heritage studies, especially between scholars and practitioners. There is a need to consult with practitioners on an ethical methodology to collaborate. This means not to for us to decide how we want to collaborate, but actually to consult on the actual system to collaborate and also a pathway for practitioners to obtain credentials as scholars too. This allows them to be both academics and practitioners. What I see as a pressing issue is the contextualization of heritage and heritage practices in a broader societal context. We could use the advantage of heritage to enable problematizations of the past in order to identify and describe moments of poor poor perception of reality as well as good perception of reality, thus implying that perhaps sometime we might actually learn from history. Our specific interest in this, in this relation is the cultural heritage strategy for the 21st century formulated by the Council of Europe. The strategy is composed of three uh, different components addressing different issues of society development. The first component is uh, the, the social component, the second one is the economic and territorial uh, component, and the last one is the component focusing on knowledge and education. And one could say that this strategy kind of boils down the UN SDGs to something that is uh, operational for the heritage sector and how it should be uh, a resource for societal development. So I could recommend that you take part of the strategy and read it. It provides a lot of challenges uh, for the heritage field to, to uh, work with. There are several pressing issues in critical heritage studies today, but I would say the most pressing issue revolves around cultural reparation and the decolonization, or what I would call the de-westernization of our approaches to heritage practice, conservation and management. And then there's also the challenge presented by climate change. When it comes to future challenges and heritage studies uh, from my department perspective it is to continue in-depth education uh, in operating heritage practices while at the same time ensuring critical reflection on all the different aspects and perspectives of this practice this is also important to relate to for instance the, the uh, heritage strategy of the council of europe when it comes to incorporating perspectives on how new areas both of professional activities and educational areas are developed in the interface between heritage and neighboring areas that might be conflicting or cooperative towards the heritage field I envision the future of critical heritage to focus on issues on uh, climate change and the environment. There is a need to consciously and ethically collaborate with communities on the ground, focusing on their understanding of their lived environments and how it relates to their heritage practices. This is something that is very critical for a lot of indigenous people, the Ainu people I work with. This, is, this should be followed by a broader or global scope on how local issues are tied to similar structures, for example, but not limited to 
techno global capitalism. So the question is really how these interconnected systems can produce new or creative ways of relating with each other and resisting. There will be more culture wars and anti-progressive sentiments creeping into the heritage space, but the future of critical heritage studies will lie in its ability to remain critically engaged with the ongoing environmental, political, and technological changes around the world. Additionally, the future of critical heritage studies is hybrid, by which I mean the fusion of digital and indigenous approaches towards sustainable heritage management and practice. So, to end, my, my ideas about continued activities of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies, uh, which the association already might to some degree work with, is primarily two, two areas. Uh, the first one, obviously, in regards to the ongoing discussions in e Egypt on COP27, is how heritage, heritage practices uh, might be um, a resource for counteracting climate change but also as a background for me uh, as a vice chair in the Swedish NGO of Cultural Heritage Without Borders established in 1995 and at that time the, the post-Yugoslavian wars going on and Cultural Heritage Without Borders has been in operation since then working with heritage as a as an instrument for uh, counteracting conflicts and be of a more preventive force in, in conflict uh, uh, conflict prone areas and this is also something I think uh, the association should address and work with uh, for our organization cultural heritage without borders this is specifically of relevance in the present ongoing Russian uh, occupation war or parts of Ukraine, where we could see that there is a big need for uh, help of all kinds of, of heritage activities in Ukraine. I do hope ACHS in the future to really address the critical issue of the lack of academic jobs for ECRs. That said, academia is not the only threat. There is definitely a need to create opportunities for non-academic careers. Go in the in the long run, this is useful for ACHS as we will be building relationships with professionals involved with communities and stakeholders, and in practice with the applied and public aspects of heritage. Today, the ACHS has been able to rally a lot of heritage practitioners together especially through its newsletter bulletins, the International Journal of Heritage Studies, and through its biennial conferences such as this one. This has created a niche platform for heritage students and experts to network, collaborate, and spotlight each other easier. I would hope that going forward, the ACHS will be able to invest more in its early career researchers by equipping them with or exposing them to workshops, seminars, and other career building opportunities, because I think this measure will ensure a sustainable and seamless transition of heritage practice and scholarship from one generation to another. I'm very excited and honored to be in this round table and I look forward to a very enriching conversation with the rest of the panelists and the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a 40, 45 minutes of a sort of informal interview here with some prepared questions. But first, so I get an idea of the magnitude of the growth of ACHS. Can you raise your hand if you were at the first meeting in Gothenburg in 2012? Nice. So that's a big, that's a big growth and a different audience, right? And you, Laura Jane, were you there? <laughs> I think we should start with some introductions, and I know everybody knows everyone by now, but uh, John, if I can ask you to get that mic and turn it on. Can we just go from your left to right and tell us your affiliation, super brief research interests, I know everyone's very prolific, 
and a brief history of your involvement to give us an idea of the roles you've held in, within ACHS. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. So, um, <laughs> you're, you're very... I you're am, very jet lagged. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, ver I'm really very jet lagged. Your, your, your role is known, but maybe if we can just a, a brief recap for new people in the organisation. Sure. Sure. My name's Laura Jane Smith. I'm a, a, a originally trained in archaeology, but I am recovering from that, and um, I, I identify myself as an interdisciplinary scholar in heritage and museum studies, and I'm from the. Um, Australian, I, I'm director of the Centre for Heritage and Museum Studies at the Australian National University. Uh, I think almost all of us are here to, today in, in, at the conference from that centre. Um, and yes, I was highly active in the, in the start of the, the association. Um, well, I'm John Giblin. I'm Keeper of Global Arts, Cultures and Design um, and uh, National Museum of Scotland, sorry. Um, and uh, I'm an archaeologist by qualification as well, um, looking at Eastern African archaeology. Um, but I, I sort of shifted a little while ago. Um, like Laura Jane, I'm a recovering archaeologist in the AA, Archaeologist Anonymous. There is a group of us. <laughs> um, but uh, since doing that, I've been focusing more on critical heritage studies, uh, particularly post-conflict heritage studies and heritage and development, and more recently um, working in museums, looking at decolonization um, of museums work. And in terms of my involvement with ACHS, uh, well, around in 2011, I was a postdoc at Gothenburg and I was just minding my own business. And then I met Laura Jane Smith. Uh, she introduced me to critical heritage studies and uh, changed my life for the better, I hope. <laughs> um, and uh, I then became the local organizer, lead organizer for the first Association of Critical Heritage Studies conference in Gothenburg um, and helped with supporting the development of the conference. And then I went on to Australia and became onto the local organizing committee there and then was on the scientific committee for UCL, so I've had uh, various different um, roles over the course. And I would like to say it's nice to be remembered and to be back here today, and I feel a little bit like a piece of heritage being here on this sofa. <laughs> and I think as well, having seen Laura Jane's presentation earlier on today when she asked us to think about uh, the consequences of heritage, I think I should have thought about the consequences perhaps of, of being here today as well, but, but I wonder what, yeah, what the consequences of all this heritage is. Hola a todos, um, I'm Victoria Vargas, I'm part of the ECR uh, network, so my involvement with Heritage is, first I need to acknowledge the privilege of being here with all these amazing people that I really admire, and also um, I'm very honored and very nervous too, so <laughs> but, um, I'm currently doing my PhD at the University of Leeds and I'm interested in the relationship between contemporary art and heritage from the colonial perspectives. Um, I became involved with the uh, association by the last conference in London, slash virtual, and I also wanted to join to the uh, organization because I knew that the, this conference was going to be here, the next one, so seems like a good idea. Hello everyone, I'm Melissa Baird. I'm an associate professor at Michigan Technological University, way, way north, on, in Lake, literally in Lake Superior. Um, I'm also an archaeologist and I'm going to use recovery in a different way. I'm actually recovering that archaeology in new ways now in this kind of forensic heritage work that I've been doing which is ground truthing, um, particularly around our extractive zones. So going back and using those archaeological skills to go remap and kind of push back. So I, I'm, I'm loving that. I'm loving I have that background. Um, I've been involved with the association since the beginning. I've been to every meeting. Um, and I was a secretary um, at, at, at intermittent moments and then again with Lucy. And then I just recently took on the role of president in 2020, um, uh, virtually, so it, it didn't feel real, um, but it does feel real now, so um, I think that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm Lucy Moise, I'm chair of the Canada Research Chair in Urban Heritage. I've been since uh, 2015, I'm a professor at uh, UCAM in Montreal. Um, I was trained as an architectural historian with a touch of anthropology. <laughs> uh, 
um, but I identify myself as a non-disciplined scholar. Um, I work mostly on the built environment in the perspective of local development, uh, urban history, tourism, public policies, and theories of heritage, obviously, as uh, we do all here. I became involved with the ACHS in 2012 when I attended uh, the conference, and a uh, great conference. Thank you, John and Laura Jane. <laughs> Uh, the great conference in, uh, in Gothenburg, attended Canberra, uh, hosted the 2016 uh, conference in uh, Montreal, became president in 2017, and became past president in 2020, thanks to Melissa here. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to be passing the mic a lot, I'm sorry. Um, let's just talking, why don't we talk a little bit about the beginning of ACHS and this movement that felt a little bit like word to mouth in the moment. So for Laura Jane and John, what were your motivations and reasons and influences for founding ACHS? I know it's probably something you can lecture on for two hours, but a, a brief insight. Um, actually, it was quite simple. Um, I, I, have to, I have to say, uh, to give credit, uh, for the, the original thought of for this, the association came from my partner, Gary Campbell, who said back in 2008, you should do this, you should do this thing. Um, we, you need a forum to, to um, uh, challenge the authorised heritage discourse and you need something to, a forum again, to, um, as an, that offers an alternative to, to ICMOS um, that would provide a, a, a forum for examining heritage as an academic critical um, area of, of, of research rather than something that was simply uh, uh, researched in terms of, of management and conservation and so on. And, and, um, and I said, no, no, no one would be interested. And, and I was too busy. Um, and then he had kept on at, at, at me. And in 2009, I left the University of York and, and moved back to Australia. And um, I was told, both by colleagues in, in the UK and colleagues in Australia, don't move. If you move, you will lose the conversation. There's a perception that there's a, a conversation, at least in Anglophone uh, contexts, that there's a conversation that goes on between Europe and North America, and that places like Australia, you know, to excuse an Australianism, us end of the world, no one will engage with you again. Um, and, and at that point, also moving back to Australia, I, I, um, uh, you know, in, in a sense they were right, and I thought, well, why, why lose the conversation, particularly in the, in, in the era of electronic communication? Why, why should we lose that conversation? And coming back to Australia too, I, th I was confronted with, um, the fact that the, the debate that I had left 10 years previously had not really moved on. And, um, and, and Australia used to be quite, you know, quite a fertile ground for debate about cultural heritage management. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the association developed as a, as, a, as a foil to ICOMOS, as a, as a challenge to ICOMOS, as a, as a way of challenging the authorised heritage discourse, traditional, you know, Western conceptualisations of doing and engaging with heritage, and as a way to engage international debate, to not lose that debate, to expand the debate. That was, that was the simple aims of the, of, of the, uh, of the association. Um, and it, um, so in, in 2010, um, talking with my colleagues about, in Australia about this, we decided that couldn't have the first conf conference in Australia because no one would come. You know, that perception that Australia was, you know. So um, I went roaming around the world asking different institutions, would you, would you host, host this? And, and I encountered Busa, who said, yeah, fantastic. And Busa and I went and, and started organising this conference and uh, we thought, we picked a venue that we thought, yeah, that'll be right, that'll hold about 100 people. Because that's what we thought we were looking at, we, we'd get 100 people. Thank God John became engaged because it blew out to what, 500, 600? It was, it was, it was beyond what we, we had conceptualised. Um, 
and um, yeah, there was a there was a serious energy at Gothenburg where it was really interdisciplinary. There were, you know, you go to not just the sessions, but you go to you know the tea breaks, dinner afterwards. There was this real buzz about talking about about cultural uh, cultural heritage, um, and I should say backtracking a bit. Um, Gary Campbell and I wrote the manifesto in, in 2011 um, to help formulate getting people to come to the uh, to, to the to the Gothenburg um, conference, and they that was very much a provocation uh, that um, you know to spark debate to get us really to really thinking about what it is that we, you know heritage does and how to how to how to rethink our, our relationships with this, this concept. Um, it received a lot of criticism, the, the manifesto, at, uh, when, when we posted that. Uh, there was a critique that we would scare uh, away um, professionals, practitioners in, in the field. And as we stressed then, and as I continue to stress now, um, while the association was conceived as a, as, a, as a space outside of ICOMOS to discuss these issues, it was never meant to be solely academic. The, 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 the provocation makes a, makes a request for academics and practitioners and community groups to all engage with, with each other to, to, to make that debate. So the, the, the point that one, and I've forgotten who, um, said that the, you know, one of the key issues going forward is is that debate with, with professionals, with practitioners, with community groups. Absolutely important. That's fundamental, for me at least, to, to the association. And the membership, right from the beginning, was always mixed, was always people who were uh, activists, who were uh, academics, of course, but also uh, uh, prof uh, professionals from, from the field. So that was, was great. Second conference that Gent John, as he said, helped organise in, in Canberra. And then I think it was really a Montreal and um, where the association solidified and became a, a, a really significant presence in, in, in the debate and, and Lucy's presidency um, lifted the association um, you know, and, 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 drove, and drove the association forward, which it's continued to do under, the current, under Melissa's current president, <laughs> presidency. So, uh, yeah, that's, I will pass the... Thank you. John, you may want to add a different perspective, or were you just dragged into it? <laughs> dragged what am I doing happily here? screaming. Um, no, well, as Laura Jane said, so it, the, when I came on board, the association was already in process of being created, and the, and the conference was sort of something on the horizon. So I was one of three postdocs at Gothenburg in the area of strength of, of heritage that was sort of the Busser. Um, was building with you behind uh, behind this, and must say it's very strange to have my old boss's head on this huge screen behind me, and to be haunted by Busser. Um, but the um, but it's great to see him again. Um, but the yeah, it was so for me the real question, I guess, rather than why did I do the manifesto because that was already being being created, and why did I do the conference? It was already on the horizon. I guess it was the question is why did I throw sort of six months or more or three quarters of a year of my life behind it and really get invested in and involved in it? I think it comes down to, like many people, post-PhD, slightly uh, disillusioned with things, but particularly I was disillusioned with archaeology at the time. I was looking for a different area. I'd moved to Gothenburg to look at critical heritage studies, well, heritage studies as I knew it then, um, working in sort of global studies department, and then um, got aware of critical heritage studies and started thinking about these things. And it was just really compelling. I really found an intellectual home in that kind of thinking. It was, um, it was sustenance at the time, I think, for a lot of my concerns around this very sort of positivist um, archaeology or heritage management area. And the idea of um, heritage as this kind of common uh, cultural production process, as well as being something that's sort of been formalized and um, sort of you know, the, the authorized heritage discourse, for example, uh, was just a really, really compelling place to be. And so that's why I threw my weight behind it, because I, I found a home and I wanted to keep that home going. <laughs> I have questions for you guys, hang on. <laughs> so then the organization keeps growing and we have new roles and things become formalized. So I was wondering for Victoria, uh, Lucy and Melissa, what were your motivations for joining and becoming so involved in ACHS in these formal capacities? Um, among my motivations was that uh, 
I was looking for people to have the same kind of questions and different answers that I was having in, in the normal spaces where I was exploring heritage. And on the other side, one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved was that knowing that this conference was, that is happening today was going to be here in Chile. I was very concerned in terms of uh, all the indigenous culture that we have around and how much they can be represented, how much of those voices are we listening and how they are being part of the conversation. So uh, I think that the, all the organizations become a place where I actually uh, am able to keep meeting people that have the kind of similar questions that I have, um, have right now. Um, I got interested in critical heritage studies in my uh, dissertation work, so I was always interested in the politics of archaeology. I you know, came up as an archaeologist, I was teaching a class on the politics of archaeology, but then uh, a kind of happenstance, I started teaching as a graduate student over in ethnic studies, which would be called critical race studies in the U.S. Um, today. And in that, those courses that I was being a TA for and teaching, I was introduced to a whole body of work that I wasn't getting over in anthropology. We were listening, you know, we were reading post-colonial theorists and other kinds of things, but over in uh, ethnic studies, we were reading works by black, lesbian, feminist scholars um, and other really kind of radical thinkers about the situation, particularly very kind of North American focus but also uh, kind of a larger uh, issue uh, and connection. So for my dissertation, I was being constrained by my uh, committee. They were saying, oh, you need to keep it in the anthropological literature. And so I actually came, I thought about this idea of this critical heritage studies, like critical race studies, and organized a session at the American Anthropological Association, and Laura Jane attend, came to that and other people, and uh, kind of put together this framework for my dissertation that allowed me to put together all of these other thinkers and ways of knowing um, so that I had that theoretical background. And if you look back at the dissertation, I missed a lot. It wasn't like fully formed idea, but it was, uh, it was important for opening up that kind of in insights into the politics of archaeology and particularly heritage, which brought me to Laura Jane's work, uh, the 2004 book. Uh, Yeah, that one there blew it, blew it out of the water, right? For me, when I read that, I, I said, this is what's going on in cultural landscapes. I'm going to organize this all around this cultural landscapes and the kind of model you provided. And it all kind of coalesced and, and then coalesced with the association and this kind of politics of heritage. So that's kind of a long-winded story, but... Sorry, Melissa, the book was the politics, because it doesn't go through the streaming otherwise, the yeah. politics of cultural heritage. Yeah, archaeological, yeah. Theory. archaeological theory. Yeah. yeah, the 2004, and I, I, I came across that copy the other day, and it's got all of these, you know, big exclamation points, and, you know, because it, it finally made sense to me, a, a way to follow it, so. Well, I, I remember actually I was, uh, how I was amazed in Gothenburg uh, to see that so many people were actually interested in discussing heritage that is not glue and nails, but actually heritage as a social phenomenon. Um, I mean, we, we, we had this, uh, what was by then an intellectual tradition in French, which were, it, uh, since the 1990s, the Etude de la Patrimonialisation, um, Investigation de la Patrimonialisation, for the translator. <laughs> um, and, um, it, but we were like 50 or 60 in any event that we would uh, host. Uh, so I thought that this ACHS and this new multidisciplinarity would be very promising uh, to, allow, to allow us to, um, to better understand heritage in our, in our society and to act on heritage in a fairer way by knowing the great variability um, of the conceptions of heritage around the planet. 
uh, and by considering obviously the participation of a greater uh, number of stakeholders and people in the production of heritage. I've always thought that uh, heritage had a vocation to uh, transform society, which is what it did in the 19th century in the way that the society of the 19th century uh, functioned. It remains, I think it remains for us to become more aware, even more now today, more aware of this power of transformation and to understand how it can be deployed today. Uh, it is for this reason that I joined the association uh, and also to, to get out of the uh, somewhat invasive uh, French paradigm of the uh, historical monument, even though we had this sort of a more constructivist tradition of étude de la patrimonialisation, less critical, more constructivist. Um, but I thought that uh, in any case, especially by questioning heritage as a political act, which was something that I did uh, uh, in French, um, I actually thought that, uh, well, it seemed to me that talking with so many people from so different horizons about this would enrich the question, and it still does today. I'm going to stay with you, keep it. <laughs> so, as the ACHS becomes more formalized, in particular after Canberra, the baton is passed on to you, Lucy, and then Melissa. So, I'm wondering what you felt you were inheriting, if you can share some of those sentiments, and um, what your visions were for how to grow the association, the challenges you thought you were facing primarily. Right? How, how did you view the growth of ACHS in relation to the growth of a critical heritage framework? I know it's a lot of questions. I should start this? Okay. <laughs> I think, as we just said, I thought and I still think uh, that uh, the ACHS uh, would carry the development of critical heritage studies, obviously, both in terms of networking and in terms of fostering new or emerging research, which meant uh, fostering emerging new scholars uh, or early, research, early career researchers. Um, I also thought that uh, ACHS would be a great way to transnationalize research. My God, I picked words that I cannot as a French-speaking person pronounce, but anyway, I thought <laughs> that uh, ACHS would be a great way to transnationalize research and to allow us to escape um, from national or colonial paradigms, obviously, uh, and a great way to, um, to do that while preserving for those who were interested in that, while preserving the idea of bringing back to the local level uh, what this transnational research uh, would allow us to develop in practices and in public policies, for example. In that line of thought, I, uh, I envisioned that it might be interesting, actually, to we're talking about uh, uh, an alternative to e-commerce, and I always thought that it might be interesting to try to establish the ACHS as a kind of advisory board or as advisory committee to, uh, to UNESCO on issues considering critical heritage studies. I mean, to, to, to challenge, we need to address the, the, the challenges, would you say? Um, so in order to simultaneously um, uh, advance our theore theoretical growth <laughs> and uh, our, our engagement in society, our impact in society. Um, more generally, I would say that my, uh, my interest in critical heritage studies was in uh, reversing paradigms in order to reverse practices, notably by ceasing to consider heritage as a fact, obviously, or as a virtue, uh, and by approaching heritage for how it can make our society and our living better. Uh, this was my idea with the, the question, what does heritage change uh, in 2016? And, yeah. And I think it's going the right way. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa, I'm sure you have a lot of visions to share as you're wrapping up so, so, the first so phase of the your... Question again. <laughs> So when, when, when the leadership passes on to you and you're elected, you must have had an idea of what you were inheriting, some concerns, some visions that maybe you want to share. I know you're in, still in the midst of it, but... Well, I actually see that as a... So we, we could think about it from like philosophical, what do we, where do we want to go as an association, but I think 
the work of any association needs to have a good foundation. And so one of the things you didn't talk about was the foundation that you built with the bylaws and the, the structures, right? So you have really good structures of record keeping, of bylaws, of, of how things work and different conference committees and VPs and who does what, you know, and getting all those things in order so that the work of the association can grow. So that's been part of my, my goal is to go in and figure out the how-tos to make sure that it's, it runs and, and moves forward. But as far as where I, I want to see the, associ the association and the kinds of things that we're thinking of, and I, I got my little crib notes here, was this idea of heritage as resistance. Right, thinking about not as heritage as a performance, not for market value or status, not as labor, and I'm thinking about like, for example, universities, but uh, heritage as resistance that's asymmetrical, that's collaborative, that's forensic, right? That, that's really working at um, thinking about the communities that we engage with, the different kinds of knowledge that we, we think about, um, particularly around expert knowledge and communities, how to reposition powers in ways that um, ties into those voices um, and moves those voices to the fore. Um, and a, a lot of times those, those kinds of uh, ways of, of heritage's resistance uh, might not feel familiar, um, and so there's going to be some uncomfortable moments in trying to refigure what those kinds of spaces look like. So, and if I can add something off script yeah. to to talk about both of your tenures as presidents, it's also a time when we manage to formalize memberships and um, devise a way of redirecting some of those funds to support early career scholars yeah. and people from marginalized and less represented communities. So yeah. I think that's huge. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. Victoria, you're up. <laughs> On the subject of critical heritage studies, as an emerging researcher and scholar, what was and is critical heritage studies to you? What is its significance? Why this organization and not another? Um, I would say that, for me, uh, is mainly the space where I can develop like a critical view of. Um, again, what I want to say is that I think that a critical heritage is the space where I can challenge those uh, abandoned structures that somehow are very present in different societies, such as. Uh, Especially in Chile, we have a lot of educational structures that keep us in the same places. Uh, and I think that somehow heritage is the space where we can somehow fight those struggles. Um, and that is one of the reasons why is this organization another and why I'm involved in this level and no other. Thank you. I'd like to go back now to the manifesto, which we had, you had already mentioned extensively in its formation, but just in particular to John and Laura Jane, whoever wants to go first. Um, with a view of critical heritage studies for the future, are there any changes or additions that you would make to it? So what are the most pressing issues and challenges of today that perhaps we didn't see 10 years ago? Something that we need to engage with. I mean, there's been quite a lot of changes in the heritage world in the last decade. Is, that, is there anything that you think, oh, we should have included this? Um, no, because the, 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 the manifesto was a starting point and it was always meant to be a starting point to engender discussion and debate. I mean, it's, it's 11 years old now. Um, I mean, I still think we do need the ruthless criticism of, <laughs> um, as we wrote in, in, in the manifesto, I think we need to keep that, that critical, uh, reflexive de debate going but there may you know there, there may be different directions that we we, we want to to adopt I and mean, the, the uh, Lucy's idea of um, you know engaging with UNESCO would never have ever been part of the debate back in you know 10 11 years ago and that's an interesting you know if we do want to have a consequence if we do want to um, uh, make the you know, to understand that the, the, you know the, the cultural and political and social work that heritage does and the consequences that it has then we need the next the next step is actually in, in 
you know, in, ensuring that the, those consequences happen uh, and that we, you know, that we facilitate um, progressive, um, you know, that social justice de debates and so on are, are engaged with in a meaningful, material way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I can't go back to the point. It was a, a starting point for discussion and it's, it's something that should be discussed every, I think, at every conference. Where do we want to go from here? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the key issues? But, um, yeah, it's not, not anything set in stone. Thank you. And John, I'm going to bring up something we discussed in private. You, something can I follow up with that as well? On the, <laughs> in on relation the to the same question, but I'm also thinking how you see this reflected in your work now that you are dealing with museums much more centrally. Sorry, can you In relation to again? the manifesto, right? And 10 years ago and now, and any changes that you would, you would make now? I mean, well, I mean, as Laura Jane said, the manifesto um, was just a provocation at the time. I must also admit to not having read the manifesto for 10 years, and I'm only coming back to the manifesto uh, because, of, because of the questioning for t today. But when I did come back and look at it, one of the things that sort of stood out to me uh, that, was, that was not referred to in it would be the issue of emotion. Um, and again, you talked about emotion a lot today, Laura Jane, but that wasn't in there. And whatever we think about the rabbit hole of various theories around effect there, Obviously, heritage is emotional. There is a strong emotional aspect to it, even if it can be applied politically as well. So I think that was something that I would, I would see wanting to come through more. Um, I also think when I look back at the manifesto, uh, it, it, it understandably set up an opposition between the top down and the bottom up, uh, between the West and the indigenous rest. Um, and I would like to think though about the power not just being this binary between up and down, but also across as well. And I think more of that, that there is not just a ideal um, other or indigenous or gra grassroots, that there's power running throughout and, and asymmetries throughout all of it. So those were some of the kind of things. But what were you thinking of um, in terms of um, museums? Just anything that you think, we were talking about how this might turn into a publication and perhaps oh. there's something to be said about how ACHS interacts with other organisations or other institutions. We yeah, well, I think, I think there is um, so a challenge for the future, I guess, in that case, um, or perhaps for the now and for the future that I see, is that in my various worlds of working... Oh, do you, you, uh, yeah, I guess so, you know, I, know, I now know what you're meaning. But the... So where I... Um, where I work in the National Museum in Scotland or when I was in the British Museum, uh, the journal, the, in the International Journal of Heritage Studies would be very well known about and I think people would know about that as somewhere where they could publish their work uh, and being very influential. But certainly across um, in my network, which is fairly broad, I don't think people would know about the Association of Critical Heritage Studies as well. We are a global organisation and we should be very proud of all the work that people and the thinking people have done over the 10 years. But I also think the impact of the association, whether it's about how we brand ourselves, but that reach, we need to be able to, we can't accommodate everybody at one of these conferences, but we can influence um, a further afield. And I sort of question how can we uh, have a greater presence and awareness in f fields of practice um, beyond the journal, actually, and about the, the work and the thinking of the association. So, yeah. Great, and you're kicking us off for the last question on the formal segment of this panel, which is talking a little bit about envisioning the future of the association and critical heritage studies. Do any of you want to share a direction in which you think we should grow? I feel, John, you just, you just kicked us off. So, anything that you thought? Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Can I go back on issues? Yes. <laughs> well, I don't want to take too much time here, but I actually have some preoccupation on issues uh, of the uh, the association uh, to, but to go back on growth and and formalizing what we can do in our impact i mean i, I was i was wondering uh, three years ago, how can we do this? I mean, how can we just come at UNESCO and in Paris and say, hi, we're there, we want to partner, you know? But I just, I would just like to see, by a raise of hand, and by a show of hands, but you won't be attacked here, who is involved with ECOMAS in this room? Raise them high. Or with TIKI or some board like this. You see there are people here already, I mean, it's pretty easy to bridge, just to formalize what we're doing here that we're also in putting there, yeah. 
just, just saying that. Um, I just want to discuss these issues because I discussed this with, with Laura Jane a few years ago. Um, I have two main uh, concerns. One is about the, uh, the Anglo shaping of critical heritage studies. That is not Anglo in, in the uh, use of English, but of course the use of English is a, a vehicle for that. Uh, and it brings out as a lingua franca, it, it comes with its own cultural background. And for example, the way that we conceptualize what is critical. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it, this tends to exclude many other intellectual traditions and many other uh, conceptions and ways of looking at things. Uh, this brings us to reject proposals of papers or, or, or of talks of anything that we see as a, being a positivist or essentialist or, or the such. And I do think that, because I know, coming from French, I know that we, we well, études de la patrimonialisation are not positivist, but they do not see uh, critical heritage studies in the same critical way, but much more in a more constructivist way. So, and I believe I have an Iranian student she doesn't see at all uh, the idea of critical heritage studies in the same way, and not to mention that there are many, many countries. I'm working in Cuba next next week. I, I just cannot talk about authorized heritage discourse there. It, it will not make sense. So if we want to enlarge to to to, to enlarge the the, the 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 possibility of participating in the conversation, we have. I think that one of the targets of the ACHS should be to be inclusive, including of those whom we think are just positivist or whatever, and, and, and just bring them to the table and have this discussion to learn more of other ways to think about heritage than in the English uh, critical perspective. Uh, do you want to say something? Yes, if it's okay, Victoria, you wanted the mic. Just to add, uh, I think one of the things that I, I, one of the issues that I think is relevant right now is to think heritage critical students as the space to be uncomfortable in the sense that even with discourses of uh, the hegemonic one uh, and so on, it's still being very comfortable with it. So I think that if there is a place where we need to be okay, okay-ish, being uncomfortable, it needs to be in these spaces. And it, it, we need also to be open to let go many of the assumptions that we have about heritage, about we, what we perceive as heritage and how those discourses are made. Thank you. Sure, we want to have some time for the audience to ask their pressing questions to you, so. Last thing I will say, I would say that the other issue is to, to, to be talking, and this is in English, about heritage. The way that we all here speak English, well, first uh, makes the English-speaking people seem more brilliant than everybody else, but that, that's the thing. But, but the other thing is that this word heritage has its meaning, and what we are hearing right here about patrimonio, tells us that there's a lot that we can do if we bring in, I, I don't know how to do that. I mean, uh, we all know the faith of Esperanto. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't have any solutions here, but I need that we do need, I think that we do need to think beyond the English culture and the English intellectual traditions, and we need to go beyond uh, this word heritage that actually tends to more and more uh, incline studies towards uh, intangible heritage and to exclude more and more uh, built heritage. And I'm seeing people in built heritage be becoming more and more uh, essentialist because they're, they're like, they're left alone. <laughs> and and it's, it's pretty funny. And I see Jessica Mays here, they nodding there, yeah. So I think that we do need to expand our vocabulary and our intellectual traditions. Thank you. Are you guys happy taking some, would you like to make a note to the, the future? 
of the organization? Well, I think um, one thing that sort of concerns me at the moment is that um, we, we get out there and we take crit critical heritage studies beyond the association and we take it not just into terms of impact in terms of practice, but out there in terms of other subject areas as well. I think heritage is being co-opted by lots of other subject areas. I sit on reviewing panels, as probably many of us do, for applications coming in. I see lot heritage being used all over the place in very uncritical ways, particularly in the field of development studies where I, I do heritage and development work. Um, people are rushing towards heritage because heritage has the opportunity to provide them with the non-Western, non-universal approach to uh, development, a, a pluriversal approach to development. But they're not thinking about heritage critically. They're not thinking about it as a, as a dissonant thing, as a, something that can be problematic. And I think uh, if we look and reflect on ourselves as well, I also see heritage folk running head on at the sustainable development goals because it yes. makes heritage relevant and it gives us a role in the world without actually understanding that within development studies, um, the, the sustainable development goals are not the only form of development. There's just yeah. one way of seeing um, development and that would be critiqued in its own subject. So I'm, it's a call for the future for us to continue to remain not only critical about our subject area, but the subject areas that we're relating, we're drawing on and to get out there and also make sure that heritage isn't being just unproblematically co-opted for other subject areas too. Yeah, I entirely agree um, and would endorse everything that my, you know, my colleagues have said and, and, and the, the, our virtual colleagues as well. And, and as I said earlier today, I think the, we're seeing a, a significant uptake of, of heritage discourses, however it may be defined, um, within a, a range of political movements, certainly within right-wing populism. Um, yeah, and, and, but also with, within movements on, of the left as well. And I think we need to be engaging with that. We need to be offering uh, alternative ways of talking about heritage so that the right can be challenged to, to um, provide a, a language of, of, about heritage, a, a critical conceptualisation of heritage for the left, which engages in emotion. I think I was having a conversation with someone after my paper to, today about how the left does um, dealing with not does uh, does not deal with emotion very well, nor does it actually deal very well with the past, um, as as a as a popular heritage conceptualisation. So I think that you know we need to be providing that that a language a, a, a discourse, if you like, to to in, engage with these wider public um, popular left and right um, you know, popular as uh, yeah, as in widely public, but also pop as in the populist on the left and on the right um, movements, that we have a, a responsibility as, as, as heritage um, practitioners and, and uh, academics to, if you like, put our money where our mouth is, you know, to, to, to engage with these, these issues. I like to think about that, and I totally agree with, with, with all, all that you're saying, is uh, I like to think of that as heritage work, right? How people are using it to defend claims or make claims or advance things, and you can see that on all, all different levels. I'm actually writing something about that now. It's taken a couple years. I'm promising to get it to you, but um, I think making that legible um, is, is, is part of the, where, where the association or the critical heritage scholars or activists need to do. I'm, I'm uh, often amazed when I see things, I'll say, oh, that's heritage, this is heritage, seeing heritage being taken up and used in um, so many ways, but have a very difficult time if on a plane and someone asks, what is heritage? Um, you go on this long-winded thing um, about what it is, so making that legible is important. Thank you all. I think we have 15 minutes to take some questions from the audience. We have Pass over there with the one microphone, which is going to be running around. So please be patient after I give you the floor so you can uh, be properly streamed and listened to. Thank you. Uh, um, hi there. Um, thanks for a fantastic first day. It's been really. It's been a lot <laughs> to take in, but it's been really interesting. I just want to pick up on that um, question of legibility and, you know, how. Um, how we make these conversations that happen in conferences, that happen in institutions, how we make them matter to, to the people <laughs> on the streets? Like, how do you make them care enough about this, th these conversations so that they, so they can also challenge sort of like, you know, the extreme left and right wing um, narratives that are being presented? Are there some 
practical steps that we can all take to do that. Well, I mean, I, I think in the very first instance, we need to be present. We need to, to be having that voice in those debates. And I think there is, there's a hesitancy to do so um, with, with by academic scholars and, 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 and practitioners. And I think part of that hesitancy is, is one of the reasons why the association was formed because there has been such a, there's been such a fight about within, you know, um, internationally, within the, the, the professional world as to what heritage can do and what it should be and, 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 and allowing a wider debate to, to happen. So that, you know, within the UNESCO ECOMOS circles, heritage is just simply understood. It's apolitical, it, it, it is what it is, it's found. And there has been a, a long and often exhausting debate to get that debate and discourse moving beyond the idea of heritage as found to heritage as a, as a political, social and cultural phenomena that does and has, you know, has consequences in, in people's lives, lived experiences. And I think we've gotten, we've, we've gotten far enough, 10 years on, we've, 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 we, we're, we're getting to a, 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 a situation where we, we do have that, we're beginning to have that clarity. The next step is to go, right, well, as I said, it's, you know, we've talked the talk, it's, walk the walk, let's get out there and, and actually engage in these activist um, events. Uh, but yes, as Lucy said, how to do that is, is what we need to do, be debating. Sorry, that's your, yours. And actually, in, in many circles, it's already it's already there. I mean, I, we're talking about Cuba. Maybe they don't have this large discussion about how to be critical of the institution, but they're already taking into account everywhere the social needs of the people when using the money, the international money, to restore heritage. They're doing social housing with it into build heritage. And the other day, I was. Uh, uh, hosting a sort of public debate on uh, on heritage and the social value of heritage uh, in Montreal and the room was full of people ordinary people just asking that if we continue working on heritage we should use heritage and I'm obviously talking about built heritage here but the same would apply um, that we use heritage to to support the social needs of the people so it's all, we, we just need to engage with that I think Um, and I just wanted to add something to that, yeah, and I think that is that heritage also needs to include uh, other ways of knowledge, yeah. and in that sense, is not staying just in, within disciplinary academic uh, forms of knowledge or scientific ways of knowledge, but including more uh, non-traditional ways of knowledge too. But but that doesn't really answer your question totally, does it? So what do you what do you what do you think the how do we get that message out? How do we what do you what are your thoughts? Um, I think it all boils down to um, specificity of language and the words that we're using. And you've like touched on it. It's like actually, if you if heritage means so many different things to so many different people in so many different contexts, then maybe we need to take more time to expand on that and you know have. I don't know, not longer conversations, but just take that time to, to make sure that we're, um, it's not even on the same page, but that we're, we're, we're having a conversation that is um, at least, uh, I don't know, the answer is really, it's really hard, but I think it is, it's that, that, you know, like choosing language carefully and, and making sure that, um, as, as some of you said, I Victoria said, it's like thinking about different different ways of um, bringing knowledge into it. But I, I don't have the answers, so that's why I asked the question. <laughs> I was hoping someone would impart it to me. Do we have another question here? Did I see? No. And on the subject of language, since it's come up, if anybody wants to try another language, between the executive committee members, a lot of whom I'm standing here and up here, we can probably handle five or seven languages, so we can try to translate. We had a question over there. Yeah. So sorry. 
All right. So whoever that was, put your hand up again. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm a little bit overstimulated, so th this can make, may come across as a bit rambly, but let me try. Um, so it, it's a question about language as well, right? A a and part of my instinct, and it comes from my uh, disciplinary training, from which I'm not actually trying to recover, but that's uh, that's something for my therapist and me to discuss. Um, but the my, my instinct is to think about it in reformist kind of terms, right? And if as a field and as an association, we're thinking that we may be ready to grab onto power, right, and take over non-critical heritage spaces, then um, is the reformist impulse in, in identifying a language to do that takeover, to go back to to revisit some of those concepts and like like resignify them, um, and if that is the instinct, then do, how do we avoid the trap of trying to dismantle the oppressor's house using the oppressor's tools? I'm going to take this because I think that I deal with the, that in my thesis, and I deal with that every day. And I think that in terms of language, we need to be aware also how the structures work. And when we are, for example, we are demanding an academic language that needs to be very strict, and we need to uh, quote in a perfect way and have a perfect English. So I think that in that sense, it's also letting go of the privilege that we have, in this case, language privilege, and start to be open to hear uh, maybe all reading papers with some scattered words in Spanish, so with some scattered words in Quechua. Yeah. And also because at the end, the people that we speak English as a second language, we are always used to reading English and, and to learn new words. And, and the effort is not on the other side. So I think that that is super relevant if we want to include the language and also more than thinking that other words to talk about heritage, it's also being aware that heritage is always from a place and a specific time. And that time is not the past. Yeah. I'm not meaning that. I think that that time is just the present, so we need to own that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think also it, it has to do with um, expanding what's accepted like in the academy, or in spaces like UNESCO and ECOMOS, which constitutes knowledge or methods. So there's lots of interesting new methods out there, um, photo voice, um, bringing in community voices, testimonials, um, the forensic heritage, forensic architecture, um, where you ground truth um, and push back on knowledge. Um, that's created and kind of destabilized things. And a lot of those uh, types of approaches are based in community and community voices, particularly photo voice, which is uh, something that is quite, quite useful. But uh, the, the one thing that's the issue is in the academy that may or may not be a widely accepted um, form of knowledge in a dissertation. Um, it has to be, you know, buttressed by some, you know, 12 page paper. Um, and uh, allowing, for example, community members um, to come in on, let's say, a dissertation uh, committee um, that don't have credentials or other kinds of knowledge that's, you know, all codified as expert knowledge, I think. I do want to add something as the vice president for chapters, and that is that we have a francophone chapter that m mobilizes their discussions in French only, presumably. I'm not part of those meetings. You're in the chapter, presumably, right? Um, and and it, it, is, it is an option for us, uh, and we've tried to build networks in other languages. So it's uh, something we're trying ex experimentally, but I think it's been very successful um, with, the, with the colleagues in Canada and France, I think. So it's part of the idea of ACHS is also to kind of have a sort of cleaner slate where we can just explore other ways of communicating. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is, if I may, a comment rather than a question. I think it's really important that those of us who are on the academic side uh, resist any attempt to start dismantling what we do as academics. I'm not saying that that's what's been suggested. 
and I'm all in favor of the kind of expansions that have been hinted at, but there is a certain type of competence which actually could be deployed in precisely the ways in, that you are calling on uh, us to open up the discourse with. And what I'm particularly thinking of is, again, the question of language. Uh, it's always amazing to me how resistant people are to learning languages, but the fact is that, that it's something we all have to do, and academics do it more commonly. I've always required my students, my, my PhD students, to give a lecture in the language of the country where they worked out of respect for their colleagues, um, not just out of respect for the people they interact with in the field because also a lot of people in countries outside of the main metropolitan areas feel, and justly so, I think, disrespected by uh, the Anglo-French hegemony. I know Lucie doesn't think that the French are getting a fair shake, but in fact, in ter if you were looking at it from the perspective of Greece or Thailand, you would certainly have that, uh, you know, that complaint. Uh, and so the comment that I want to offer is it's certainly, I think, in the spirit of what's being said, but uh, a little bit more polemical. That is, academics certainly need to be sensitized to the ways in which they can interact with non-academics. What is really important is that they should not then give up, as there are pressures for them to do, those competencies that make them skilled at what they do. They should just stop thinking of themselves as having a superior profession. Can so. I ask you something? By all means. Are those competence or privilege? Yeah. Competence or? Privilege. 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 So uh, obviously uh, those who have been trained in universities in the metropolitan centers uh, are, and I am guilty as charged, right? So it, this is certainly uh, precisely the point. We have something to share. And it's certainly really important that we should, one of the things we can share is the knowledge about where these terms like heritage came from. And I've been making this point throughout the, the day, actually, that, that there is a lot of information that we can provide that will help to destabilize that hegemony. I'm very much on the side of destabilizing the hegemony. I am not, however, on the side of then throwing out the baby with the bathwater. This is the point. Uh, thank you, Professor Hertzfeld. Um, as a first generation working class scholar who went through some pretty privileged places, I can say that in many ways that knowledge is um, codified, protected, and needs to be um, shaken up a bit because um, yes, you can have competencies, but those competencies are not necessarily the ones that we need today. Um, and we're not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. What we're saying is we need to expand um, our methods, our theories, and who's in those places and who has those knowledges um, and who makes those decisions. Um, just Yeah, uh, I just want to add that when you demand those competence, you are also erasing my identity. You are also erasing part of my culture, my accent. So at the end, because it's neutralizing it. So at the end, I felt a bit attacked. <laughs> but um, it's also valid. We have a question in the back. Dante? Hi, thanks. Um, I was hesitant at first, but then, you know, after listening to Melissa said that, like, she's, she's having trouble when she's on a plane and trying to you define heritage, I was just thinking, well, I've just, you know, um, encouraged me to, to, uh, to pose this question. Um, after 10 years, I mean, I, I know you, you guys have talked about it, but uh, after 10 years, um, why heritage and what for?
To transform society, to keep transforming society. I mean, heritage has been used like that by the elites in the, in the 19th century. I think that we can still use heritage no matter how we call it in that way. Uh, and, and maybe to, to bring more answer to the, the lady who was asking about defining heritage and what is heritage, I, I do believe that heritage is whatever you call it heritage. And, and, and hence, our power as scholars is to share this and to enable people to call heritage what they think is heritage. I've been working with uh, communities for years now, um, trying to uh, untangle the, the idea brought a lot in French, but also in other languages, that heritage or patrimoine is this thing that is identified by experts, you know? So people ask you, is this heritage, is this patrimoine? And, and what I've been trying to do in that way is uh, to tell the people, tell me your stories about this or that heritage, and to show by publishing these stories, by uh, exhibiting them with expert narratives, that their narratives and their experience are worth as much as my narratives and my experience. And so this is uh, transforming society uh, with the help of heritage. Because when you speak, when, when you're a normal person, and you suddenly discover that you speak heritage, this very valued thing in society, you, you're already changed. Seems like a simple recipe, it's not, but I'm, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> Choki? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm listening to all of this and my head is just like, wow. Okay, so when we talk about heritage, are we talking about written heritage? Is the medium in which we're talking about heritage the one that, okay, we're experts, right? It's written, it's published. Okay, so what about the elders in the communities that we consider as our own experts? So do we erase that competency, right? Because they don't write theirs, or they don't publish, or I'm trying to understand because different parts of the world have different ways of impacting this medium we call heritage. I want to go back to my childhood where Tacit knowledge is very important as well. So the intangible, the, in the tangible and intangible are intertwined. You do not separate any of them. Nature culture is intertwined. You're sweeping, right? So when you're sweeping the ground, you're told or you're taught or your tacit knowledge tells you that you're communing with your ancestors. Now, does that mean that I am not an expert within my tacit knowledge? On the contrary, so I'm sorry, we, because we're streaming for major inclusivity. So here, we have to do this on the mic. So you're so welcome to ask for a mic and then have a report. I'm trying to understand that different parts of the world have different ways of impacting knowledge or transmitting knowledge or taking on knowledge to the next gener generation, right? So now we need to understand that everyone, as much as we are similar, we're also different, and we do this in different ways, and we need to acknowledge these different ways, and also acknowledge that every person is an expert within their own heritage. Every person. We are not leaving one person behind. Even those that say cancel culture, they have something to say. They some, there's a reason why they're saying this. And we need to be able to understand that we're all not coming from, you know, the same thinking, the same ideologies, the same whatever, but we are all trying to impact something and we're all trying to speak out somehow. And we need to acknowledge that. And that's it. Thank you, Toki. I think we have time for one more question. And there's one, somebody in the back in the red top pass. Ahí está con una ramera roja.
ti. Hola, I don't speak in English, sorry. Dale, yo trato de interpretar. Perfecto. Pero si lo haces un poco simple. Va, es solo, es un comentario más que pregunta. Eh, yo soy una mujer maya mexicana y mi pueblo pasó por un proceso de quema de códices. Entonces mucho de nuestro patrimonio, conocimiento, tradiciones, ideas se quemó en la hoguera. So we have a colleague who's a Mayan woman and her people have gone through a process of a burn of archives of códices. Entonces, gran parte del patrimonio vive en la memoria de nuestras abuelas. Sin embargo, se vive un racismo que intersecciona muchos lugares. Y are in material living treasure but they don't want to talk about this knowledge because of fear of of this type of knowledge they also deal with, with the fear of having to talk about this knowledge Porque because the violence has been historical oppression has been historical and young people me as a young person i try to approach them but they keep silence Puedes repetir, discúlpame, <laughs> no es lo que hago. <laughs> eh, que yo intento acercarme a, a las abuelas. So, so, in the spirit of what we're talking about, she attempts to approach the grandmothers in order to, to be able to preserve this knowledge and, and, and transmit it, but there is a lot of self-censorship, autocensura, ¿no? From them. Um, y... So then we discovered that we could not press them to speak because that was also a way of a form of being aggressive. The violent encounters, we can all agree, I'm sure everyone has experience having dealt with this in other contexts. Entonces, como somos... So since we are a generation that dwells in internet, we created an issue to call Maya Winal, which is uh, digital activism. Maya Winal. Winal is a Maya account. We have it not as a 30-day, but as a 20-day account. Her generation is uh, offering another platform, which is an internet platform called Maya Winal, um, which is um, the calendar. It's, Winal is the name for the, calen the Maya calendar. Entonces, so, Maya people from different territories started to approach and they started looking in the youth at something called Masewa, like an awakening, a reconnection. Uh, uh, platform and there was a, a, a process that you call Masewal? Masewal. Masewal, like an, like an awakening, right, of people joining this platform and, and contributing to, to, to solving this challenge. Y algunas and some grandmothers started to speak out. The grandmothers started to, to be able to speak in that forum. Sin embargo, nevertheless, for example, in my community, there's only four women who speak Mayan and who carry certain traditions. Carriers of this knowledge left. Y yo vine aquí. And I came here precisely because we still have not developed the necessary tools to have this knowledge brought by the grandmothers inherited, transmitted. I wanted to share this because right now I feel so many emotions, so many thoughts and I would really love it, love it if I could not have been come here alone, but to have come with uh, more people from our community for them to understand me because they feel I'm weird. I do weird things. I'm hoping the emotions. Espero que las emociones sean porque sentís que hay una comunidad que apoyaría acá. But she she wishes there were more people that are joining her struggle that could have attended the conference. Porque because I'm a woman, I'm young, and very often for those reasons I feel I'm not heard. 
she's, she says she's considered like the crazy person that is always like battling with this. And being young and being a woman also uh, deters from her ability to have a powerful voice. Pero las but young people are also building knowledge. That's all I wanted to say. She just wants to point out that, that the younger generation is also building really valuable knowledge. And that's the end of her comment. Thank you. Gracias por compartir. Or maybe you can just approach us and approach one of your, whoever inspired you in this conversation during the next few days and, and continue the conversation. Thank you.